Like this, we got a new pulpit. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> so uh, if you were here last week, you know that we be- began the final series in a year-long study called The Story of Jesus. This uh, series you just saw is the, is the Return of the King. It's examining the story of Jesus from the last book of the, of the Bible, the book of Revelation particularly examining images of Jesus in the book of Revelation. Now, I know some of you, when you hear about, ooh, we're studying Revelation, you get really excited because you think we're going to talk about the beast and the end of the world and predicting all that stuff. Others of you get really nervous, like, oh, I hope it's not going where I think it's going. Um, Let me tell you, um, reading the book of Revelation as an instrument to predict exactly how the world's going to end is like reading a book of uh, Shakespeare's love sonnets to try to fix your car's engine. It wasn't written for that. You're going to get confused, and it's not going to work out that very well. It was written for a couple of purposes, and Pastor Brian mentioned these last week. Let me just review them for you. I think we know a couple of things in general that the book of Revelation tells us about the end of history and how the world's going to come together and end. Number one, history is not cyclical. Human history is not moving in an endless cycle. It's moving toward a determined, fixed point and end. And we know that. There's God has set a day. He doesn't tell you when that day is, but he, he knows, and he said it. Number two, in general, things are going to get worse before they get better. Some of us can see that already in the world. The myth of modern progress seems to be just that, a myth. Number three, Jesus is coming back, and he will judge the world and everyone in it. Number four, those of us who love and trust him must endure in hope and in joy and in faith until he does. That's pretty much it in terms of the end of the world but it has a lot to say about who Jesus is, what kind of savior this is, why we should trust him. That's what it's written for. Let me, uh, and it's, it's what's called apocalyptic literature. You don't make apocalyptic literature literal. You must understand the symbolism and the imagery. Let me give you an example. Imagine with me that a thousand years from now, people discover uh, a writing from our day. They, honor, they, they, they dig it up and they find it. And it reads like this, in the year 2016, the great child of the great bear, after a hundred years of misfortune and calamity, the childish bear did finally arise and conquer. After defeating the evil red birds from the west under the arch, then did triumph over those wearing red stockings from the city of beans. Right? We would know what it's talking about. The Cubs beat the Cardinals and won the pennant and then won the World Series. We would get that. But a thousand years from now, who is the child of the great bear? Right? Who are the evil birds from the West? Like, it's, it's symbolic literature. It's not meant to be taken literally. At least not all of it in the way that many of us do. And you get way off track, stuck in the weeds and, the, and make mistakes when you try to make everything correlate to something today. Some of you are just got very disappointed. Well, too bad. <laughs> It is a revelation, not revelations. It's one revelation, and it's not the revelation of John. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ given to John. Revelation 1 verse 9 says the revelation of Jesus Christ. The primary thing that's revealed is who Jesus is, what he's going to do. John, as you know, wrote this. I hope you know, but you may not. He wrote this. uh, This revelation was given to him. He wrote it down while exiled on the island of Patmos. You'll see a map here that'll show you where Patmos is, in case you don't know. It's in the Aegean Sea. It's one of these uh, uh, sort of desolate, rocky outcroppings, uh, islands in the Aegean, between modern-day Turkey and Greece, then that day called Macedonia. Uh, That's Asia Minor and Macedonia in in John's day, today Turkey and Greece. That's where Patmos is. Next, you'll see an image of sort of the, this is off the tip of Patmos, looking at the rocky outcrops. Today, it's a tourist attraction. Take a cruise ship there. It's a great place to go and enjoy. But in those days, it was very desolate, very remote. Nothing grew there, but nobody went there. And John was exiled there. While on exile, away from the people that he loved, his brothers and sisters in Christ, away from the growing church, he's given a revelation of who Jesus is. This is also during, in the the beginning point, a very intense time of persecution for the early Christians in the Roman Empire. So people living under persecution and a man living in exile need to be encouraged about who Jesus is and what he's going to do. Our text and our theme comes from Revelation chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. It'll be on the screen if not. Revelation 5, I'll read the first 14 verses. We're looking at Jesus as Lamb. 
Revelation 5, 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked. And I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, number of myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. That's pretty clear, right? It's beautiful. It's powerful. The lamb, by the way, is the dominant image for Jesus in the book of Revelation. There are other images. We heard about the warrior. We're going to talk about the judge. There are other images of Jesus. But the primary uh, predominant image throughout the book of Revelation for Jesus is the lamb. We've been singing about the lamb and the blood of the lamb. I think this chapter, Revelation 5, everybody wants to talk about the end, Revelation 20, 19 and 20, where there's judgment, the 22, the wedding feast of the Lamb, or some of the chapters in the middle where some of the crazy stuff happens, the beast and the dragon and the Antichrist and so on. But I think the centerpiece of Revelation, the central theme of the whole book is right here, what we just read in Revelation chapter 5. Imagine like this. The curtain of this world is pulled back. Paul says we see through a glass darkly. We don't see everything clearly. It's like, Paul, it's like John is given a glimpse into ultimate reality. The book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul says, this world is not all there is. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and principalities of, and authorities of the dark world. There's a spiritual battle, a spiritual reality of light and darkness behind this earthly flesh and blood reality. We don't always think that way. I don't know what you think about that, but the Bible's clear that there's a reality behind this reality. And so imagine that the curtain of this world is pulled back and John gets a glimpse into ultimate reality, into what's behind it all. And what is behind it all? Worship. At the heart of ultimate reality is worship. At the essence of who God is and what's going on is praise to the God who made it all. That's that's the, at the heart of ultimate reality. That's where all history is headed. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess. If you think of worship as like, I'm gonna sit on a cloud and sing songs forever, that's not what we're talking about. Glorifying the God who made us with our whole lives, that's what's going on in ultimate reality. John's given a glimpse of that. Re psalm 19, some of you know this psalm, right? The heavens declare the glory of God. Right? The, the, all the earth displays his handiwork. Night after night they pour forth speech. There is no language on all the earth where their voice is not heard. In other words, nature itself is declaring the glories of God. I have a good friend who says a rock glorifies God better than you because it's existing according to its created purpose. You, on the other hand, don't always do that. We waver in our created purpose. But all history is moving toward a day when we will all glorify him. This is the purpose for all things. Keep this in mind so as we go, you don't get caught up in some of the trees. You see the whole forest. Chapter 4, which we didn't read, is primarily focused on the throne of God. In chapter 5, John shifts his focus because of the revelation to the Lamb. But first he talks about the scroll. A couple things, important things about a scroll in the ancient world. A scroll was not read like this. It wasn't opened up vertically and read like your, like your town crier reading an announcement. 
it was laid out on a table and, and opened up horizontally. And you would unroll this part and roll up this part so you'd find the section you wanted to read, written in narrow columns in Greek. The scroll, by the way, the book of Revelation, as it would have been written in ancient Greek, would take about 15 feet of scroll material in the ancient world. That's a pretty normal-sized scroll. So these scrolls were rather substantial, and you unrolled them like this to find the spot you wanted to read. We're told this scroll has writing on front and on back. Did you notice that in the, in the text? It was writing within and without, on front and on back, the scroll. That was unusual in the ancient world. That didn't happen. Why? Because you wanted to roll the scroll up to protect it, and you had only writing on the inside. There's no way to flip it over if it's all rolled, right? It would be awkward to unroll it. So this was un whatever this scroll is that's referred to in Revelation 5, it's big, and there's a lot of stuff on it, both sides. And the scroll is in the right hand of him who sits on the throne. By the way, that's a reference for God the Father. Over and over again, we, we, we see in this passage, the one who sits on the throne is God the Father. So in the right hand, the power hand, the authority hand is a, of God the Father Almighty is a big scroll with a lot of stuff on it. That's the image so far. We don't know what's on it, though, just yet, anyway. It's sealed with seven seals. People always want to know, seven's the number of completion and perfection. What's the, what's the meaning of seven and the seven seals? And if you know anything about Revelation, the next several chapters are the breaking of those seals and the unfolding of that revelation on the earth. Did you know that in the, in the, in the Roman Empire, the ancient world, the first century, an emperor's will, the divine will of an emperor, had to be sealed with seven seals? Augustus, Caesar Augustus, seal, will, had seven seals on it. Vespasian, seven seals on it. Domitian, seven seals on it. John, exiled by the Roman emperor. I think what he's saying is there's another emperor and he's not in Rome. And he's also got a divine will. And it too is sealed with seven seals. And it's far more powerful than anything you can imagine in the Roman Empire. The basic idea here is that God holds in his hand a specific will for the purpose, the blessing, the judgment, the unfolding of all things. Ultimately, his sovereign will. Then John sees a mighty angel sort of shouting a question. Who can open it? I mean, if God has a will for all things, how it's all going to unfold in the end, wouldn't you want to know what that is? But nobody can read it. The angel asks the question, and nobody can open the scroll. Opening the scroll, breaking its seals, and looking into it, these are symbolic language to describe uh, bringing about the divine will of God. So in the ancient world, to, to, speak, yeah, to speak something was to enact it. You ever remember, you remember the story of Abraham and, and Isaac when he steals the blessing? It's just words. Why doesn't old Isaac go, oh, I take it back. Put those words back in, I'll say it to, some, you know, to Esau now. Because in the Hebrew mind, to speak it is to make it so. How did God create the world? By doing a creation dance? He might have. By speaking it into existence. Words have power. So to open the scroll and to break its seals and to read its contents is to make it so. This is why John weeps. Who's going to make it so? Who's going to bring about the will of God? Can no one do this? How I long for the will of God to unfold. Who can do it? And there's like this little search that goes on right in the chapter, right? All creation, nobody's worthy. Nobody can look and nobody can open the seals and nobody can read. By the way, 24 elders and the four living creatures, don't get too caught up in that. 24 elders, 12 and 12, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles. It's symbolic language for all who belong to God by faith in Christ. That's what it's talking about. Four living creatures, most scholars think this is a reference to all living things. We can go back to chapter four and dig into that, but not now. <laughs> So one of the elders then says, good news, he says, weep no more. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the one that can open the scroll. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Now some of you know your Old Testament, and you know that's a messianic title. And just to, so you don't miss the point, John throws in the revelation that it's the root of Jesse. If you know Dave, Jesus' lineage, he's the root, the seed of Jesse, the branch of Jesse. Is d d Jesus born into that line, King David's line. And he's called the lion of the tribe of Judah in Genesis chapter 49, um, in Isaiah 31, Hosea chapter 11, over and over again, you see this reference to the lion of the tribe of Judah. In other words, um, God protecting his own like a lion. What's a lion do? A lion roars, a lion conquers, a lion devours, right? A lion's the king of beasts. 
when I took my little boy Benjamin when he was in fourth grade to the, as a chaperone to the Brookfield Zoo with his fourth grade class, um, I, my wife was sick and I had to go in her stead. And I had six fourth grade boys. That was like a challenge of my leadership ability to keep six fourth grade boys on task. Can you have like your sheet? You're supposed to go to these different parts of the zoo. And we went to the lion's pit, whatever it is, you know. And they had heard in class that the lion's roar can be heard for up to four miles in the African plains. And they really wanted the lion to roar. But if you've been to the zoo, the lion's like doesn't care what you want. Lions like, I've been, yeah, kids, move along here. I'm tired. You know, they're, like, they're not really there for your amusement. And so the boys are on the railing going, rawr, rawr, it's rawr, it's a lion. The lion's just like, mm-hmm. You know, and I try to get the kids to move along because it's a little bit embarrassing. They won't stop roaring. The lion's looking at us. And they, they wouldn't leave. They want to hear the lion roar. So I finally figured, well, if you can't beat them, join them. So I'm roaring with them, rawr, it's a lion, you know, on the edge of the cage. People are walking by like, oh, the poor troubled man and his children, you know, at the, at the zoo. <laughs> anyway. Basically, we got tired of roaring, and the lion was just looking at us, so we moved on. We got about one, whatever, exhibit over, and the lion roared. Those six boys wet their pants. You ever hear a lion roar, really roar? Shook your heart, shook the ground. It was unbelievable. We ran back, oh, you know? That's the image. The lion of the tribe of Judah. The conqueror. The devourer of, of the enemies of God. The king. Aslan, Right? That's what the elder says John's going to see. So John expects to see. What does he see? What does he see? Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And John turns around, and between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw not a lion, a lamb. You'll see an image here of a lion and a lamb together. The juxtaposition, the contrast between lion and lamb. My little boy said, does the lion eat the lamb? Like he thought it was like a video from YouTube or something. No, no. They don't. The lion and the lamb. This imagery is all over scripture. It's so important for us to understand. The contrast here is crucial. A lamb is not the image of power or conquest that any human being would conjure up in the first century for their champion. The essence of the Christian story is that a lamb comes to do a lion's job. That's the heart of the gospel. What does John the Baptist say when he sees Jesus walking and he's coming to the Jordan River? Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah? No. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let's look at a couple of aspects of the lamb. We've talked about some of them already. The worthiness of the lamb. The worthiness of the Lamb. I mean, the whole point is who, can, who is worthy to open the scroll? Who is worthy to speak and hold and bring to pass the divine will of God? The Lamb. And again, the emphasis is not on the contents of the scroll so much as the one who's worthy to open it. Uh, verses 7 through 9 of chapter 5. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Notice that. The Lamb went and took the scroll. It wasn't given to him. He didn't ask for it. He didn't beg for it. He didn't have to wait. He went and took it out of the right hand of who? God the Father Almighty. That's telling you this lamb has power and authority. Uh, so I've read some scholars uh, who get screwed up on this, and they want to know uh, how, how did the lamb take the scroll? This is what happens when you get too far into the weeds of Revelation and want to try to make everything a symbol. How does the lamb take the scroll? Did the lamb bite it? Did he use it with his hooves? Did he poke it with a horn? How did the lamb take the scroll, right? It's not the point. The point is the lamb has authority to take that scroll. The lamb is Jesus. The Son of God. God has a perfect will for all things, and only Jesus Christ is worthy to hold it, to open it, to look into it, and to read it. That's why the four living creatures and all creation fall down in worship. The first thing they do when the Lamb holds the scroll is what? Hey, look at that, Lamb holding the scroll. No, they fall down and worship Him and declare Him worthy. The worthiness of the Lamb. This, if nothing else, this should encourage your heart. God has a specific will how it's all going to unfold. And no one, none of us could possibly look into that or comprehend it. It would be way too much for us. But there is one who can. He's the Lamb of God. And he will. Next, the weakness of the Lamb. Lambs in general are not very strong animals. Not symbols of power. But this is not an ordinary lamb. Let's read again verse 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. 
You ever seen a lamb with seven horns? You said that should, lamb should be in a circus or like on YouTube or something, right? That's not a normal lamb. You ever seen a lamb with seven eyes? That'd really be a curiosity, wouldn't it? This is not an ordinary lamb. Well, what do these things mean? In the, in the, in the, in the ancient world of, of the Bible, horns were symbols of power. Blow the shofar, the ram's horn, right, to call the armies of God, to assemble the people. A horn was a symbol of power. Seven's the number for perfection. This lamb has perfect power. Has perfect power. Eyes in the ancient world, in the biblical literature, are symbols of knowledge and wisdom. This lamb has seven eyes. This lamb has perfect power and perfect wisdom and knowledge. Now we're getting a sense for why he's worthy, right? Perfect power, perfect knowledge to look into the divine will of God. But we're also told something else. Verse 6, the first part of it. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing, what does the Bible say? As though it had been what? Slain. Does that strike you as odd? What does it mean, the lamb was standing as though it had been slain? You know how you sacrifice a lamb in first century temple worship? Cut its throat, drain all of its lifeblood out. This is not a lamb with a boo-boo or a, a bound up leg. This is a lamb with a bloody gash and probably the front of its white wool covered, stained in blood. This is a lamb standing as though it had been not, not injured, not wounded, not poked or pricked, slain, killed, slaughtered. Get the image? Shocking image. This is a, a sacrificial lamb. A lamb with the marks of its death on it still. Perfect power, perfect knowledge, open the scroll, and yet standing there as though it had been slaughtered. Notice in verse 8, he's declared worthy. Why? They fall down before the Lamb, holy and harp, and the golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. That's a beautiful image, isn't it? Wish we had time to get into that. They, they hold in their hands golden bowls of incense with all the prayers of saints. Incense is, a, is to be a pleasing aroma, a symbol of worship, of the prayers going up to people. Incense burning in the temple. Do you see what the image is here? When you pray, regardless of how theologically astute you are, or how much you know the Bible, or how long you've been a Christian, or how frustrated you feel in your, in your ability to pray, when you cry out with an earnest heart to God, that prayer is symbolized being held in a precious golden bowl before the throne of God. That's how much he cares about his people. Those are our prayers. Our prayers to God are to fill his temple, to fill his throne room with a pleasing aroma. Anyway, notice we're in, in verse um, 9, and they sing a new song, Worthy are you to take up the scroll and open its seals. Why? For you were slain. Not only the horns and the eyes make the lamb worthy, power and, and wisdom, but because he was slain makes him worthy. What does this mean? Unlike earthly superpowers, D.A. Carson writes this in his commentary on this passage, unlike earthly superpowers that get their way by force or manipulation, God achieves his purposes through the apparent weakness and defeat of a sacrificial victim. John expects to see the lion of the tribe of Judah standing in its flowing mane and all its power and majesty, and he turns around, and what's he see? A weird-looking lamb with its throat cut. Not the, not the image he'd think. But that's our God. He doesn't do things how we would do them. We should be eternally grateful. He's a slain lamb, that's death, who's standing, that's resurrection. You see the symbolism? This is pointing to Jesus. It should be obvious to us. But to those that John was writing this, penning this to and sending it to, there's hidden imagery in here to encourage their hearts. A slain lamb standing, a dead lamb risen. But the weakness of the lamb, by the way, this is important to say, is a chosen weakness. This lamb is not there because it's meek and got beat up and, and evil men overpowered like the poor little lamb couldn't defend himself. Philippians chapter 2, we're told that Jesus emptied himself, took on the position of a servant, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. In other words, he says, he says the same thing in John chapter 10 verse 18. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. In other words, this lamb is sacrificial because he chose to be. This is the lion who chose to be a lamb for us. The weakness of the lamb is not the absence of power. I think it's the ultimate display of power, the perfect display of power. 
Most of us would prefer the lion. Lions roar, lions devour, lions conquer. Lamb is quiet. Lamb gets killed. What does Isaiah 53 verse 7 say? Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, he was silent. Like a sheep before its shearers, he opened not his mouth. This lamb's not roaring. This is how our God conquers. Now, God's way is not the way of the Roman Empire. I think that's clear from the replica of Revelation, isn't it? God's way is not the way of the European powers in the Middle Ages that would come. God's way is not the way of the Holy Roman Emperor under Charlemagne and so forth. It wasn't the way of Constantine necessarily. It wasn't the way of the British Empire. No offense to you, Andrew. It's, uh, God's way is not the way of the United States of America or the American dream. It's never been that way. It's not the way of power and might of the world. It's the way of the Lamb. Now, in theory, most of us are okay with this. I want a lamb who's worthy. I like that part, worthiness of the lamb. Praise the lamb. Yes, we sing those songs. I also like the idea of a lamb being weak because that's for my salvation. He's, la- he's slain for me, and so I like that part of the lamb. But here's the question that I've been wrestling with since preaching this last week. What if the lamb is not just weak, but he calls me to be? What if the way of the lamb is to be your way and my way? What if you cry out to God for conquering power and he says, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. We trust that the lamb was slain for our salvation. We sing songs about his blood. Will we follow in his way? The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 9 I just quoted a small portion of it for you. And if you know anything about Paul, Paul was a a brilliant man, an incredibly driven man, accomplished great things for the kingdom of God, establishing the church, but a guy who was not above being a little, uh, uh, not afraid to tell you about his resume, not afraid to tell you about things he'd accomplished. Probably a man given to arrogance. If you know anything about his background as well, let's read verses seven through nine. So to keep me from becoming conceited, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from becoming conceited. In other words, Paul says, I'm doing great things, God's showing me great things, and I'm learning great things, and to keep me humble, I had this physical ailment, spiritual ailment, a thorn in the flesh, something troubling him. And then he says in verse 8, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. I don't think it's three times. One, two, three. I think it's three seasons of prayer and fasting. God, take this away. Take this away, God. Pleading with him. What does God say? What's God's answer to this great man of the faith pleading with God to take away his weakness? But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This, is, this is, should be troubling to you. Most of us, when it comes right down to it, we want the lion. Give me the lion. Conquer this for me, God. Overcome this for me, God. What if the answer is, I've given you the lamb. I want you to trust my grace. I want you to trust me in your weakness. The way of the lamb is not defeatism or, or resignation. It's the way of total reliance. Second Peter chapter 2, when he was reviled, he did not revile. When he was tortured, he did not respond in kind, but he entrusted himself to the one who is trustworthy. So the way of the lamb, the way of weakness for me and for you is not, doesn't mean I, I just get walked on. doesn't mean I just, I just get beat up in life. It means I place my hands fully in his care. And if that means that God calls me to a life of, of weakness, of suffering, of struggle, then I trust the lamb. Now, don't misunderstand me. This does not mean it's wrong for Christians to have wealth or high positions in government or own businesses or achieve great things. That's not wrong. That's a good thing. But here's the question. If God elevates you, if God blesses you such that you should rise to that position in whatever field, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to lay it down and surrender it and use it to bless others and to serve and glorify him? Or are you going to claim it as your own? The Lamb's way is our way. There is no other way. Last, the worship of the Lamb. 
the worship of the Lamb. The Lamb is worthy, the Lamb is weak, and this brings us back to the whole point of this chapter. Notice that Revelation 5, the worship of the Father and Son are the same thing. By the way, if you ever uh, argue people about Jesus not being God, did he ever claim to be God? Does the Bible say he was God? Is he just another great teacher, great man, great inspirational prophet? It's, it's right here in Revelation 5. The Father, the one who sits upon the throne, and the Lamb, the Son, are worshipped as co-equals. In ultimate reality, a glimpse into heaven, right? That's what's going on. Jesus, the slain lamb, being worshipped in heaven in the, in the presence of the one who's on the throne. How else can he take the scroll from the right hand of God the Father Almighty, open it and declare its contents, have all the creatures before the throne fall down and worship him, and the Father do nothing? But celebrate him. Notice in verse 12, and I know I'm jumping around here, apologies. Uh, 5 verse 12. If I can find verse 12. You know what? I need, I need readers now. My wife, I need glasses. I got them at Walmart and I forgot them. Uh, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Seven attributes of worship right there. Seven things listed. You notice that? What is seven a symbol of? Perfection. Perfect worship. Worthy is the Lamb to receive perfect worship and praise. Right there. Uh, chapter uh, 4, verse 11, not on the screen, but it'll be in your Bible, so if you flip there. Uh, in chapter 4, the verse, it, it ends with this verse. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. That's God the Father. That's, that would sum up the Old Testament. Worthy are you, our Lord God, to receive all these things because you created all things. And then flip to 5.13. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory forever and ever. 5.13 sums up the New Testament, right? Old Testament, worthy are you, God and Father, for you created all. New Testament, worthy are you, Lamb of God, for you were slain. Same God. There's also, I think, a direct connection between our worship here on earth now and what's going on in heaven. A couple verses that highlight this. Verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and the golden bowls of incense. Our prayers. The prayers of the saints. You ever think of yourself as a saint? I'm not a New Orleans saint. Right? No, no, I'm not a saint. If you grew up Catholic, I don't, I, I, I don't be confused by this. A saint is simply one who's been redeemed by God, called into his family, and has lives his, their li his or her life to, to, to honor and glorify him. You're a saint. When you pray... Your prayer is precious when you offer that to God. Verse 9, they sang a new song. Worthy are you to take up the scroll, to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe, language, and the people in every nation. Meaning, you, the Lamb of God, brought in people from all languages, nations, tribes, and tongues. To do what? You've made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. That's not just a future reality. That's a present reality. What does it mean to reign with Christ on earth? We could spend a whole series of sermons on this. Simply put, what it means is when you live your life for his glory, when you surrender your rights and privileges for the good of the other, when you give away yourself in service, when you're radically generous, when you commit yourself to following what he calls you to do as best you can, it doesn't mean you're perfect, you are reigning with him. Imperfectly, which will be perfected someday. But you've been ransomed by the lamb. You've been bought purchased, brought into the kingdom, into the family, to, do, to just hang out? No, to reign. Kings have a reign. Kings have a kingdom. We reign with him. This reign is not just a future reality, it's a present reality. Friends, if, if worship is ultimate reality, if worship for God and the Lamb is the end goal of all reality, then my question is, will you and I align our hearts with ultimate reality? If praising God with my speech, with my thoughts, with my heart, with my work, with the way I treat my wife and my children and my friends and the people I meet that I don't even know, if the goal, ultimate reality is to give glory to God in everything, will you line your life up with that? Or will you live contrary to ultimate reality? I'm going to seek my glory most of the time, and once a week I'll show up and, oh, the blood. Right? That's, that's not, you understand, that's, we are doing ourselves a disservice. We're living outside of our created design. We're not aligning our hearts with what's ultimately real and true and right. 
And I'm speaking to myself as much as you. The bottom line is, we know what worship is. It comes to the old English word, worth-ship. Question being, is he worth it? Is whatever it is worth your life? That's the question. I, I, one of the best places where worship is described, but it's really used this way, is in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. This is a story, it's a one, one, one verse parable. Some of you might know this parable. A man discovers a treasure hidden in a field, just an ordinary field, and he goes and sells everything, liquidates all of his assets to buy that field. Is it worth it? Think about being that guy's wife. You bought what? That worthless field down the street? No one's, nothing grows there. No one's bought that. Think about being that guy's friends or business partners. This makes no sense. What are you doing? You're foolish. Is it worth it? Yes, because that man knows what's in that field. It's worth it. It's worth it and a thousand times more. When I read Revelation 5, the question I think we have to ask ourselves is, is he worth it? Is this lamb upon the throne, the one who was slain? Who, and by the way, do you know why he's standing before the throne as one who was slain? Because anytime you repent of sin and cry out for forgiveness, that lamb is always there, interceding for you. His sacrifice wasn't once upon a time, it's always effectual. Doesn't mean he's sacrificed over and over again. It means it's always present before the Father and available for you, his mercy. Is that lamb worth it? Is he worth my life? Is he worth your life? When you get that picture, that's what the revelation's for. So that we would go, how short-sighted I've been. How short-sighted of me to think that my life could just be, you know, some spiritual guidance now and then and go to church and sing a few songs and feel good about myself until next Sunday. That's not, I don't want to be that kind of follower. We're called to reign with him. We reign in our weakness because the grace of our Lamb is sufficient. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing Revelation song. How appropriate is that? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we bow before you and worship that you indeed are a good and gracious God, and we're an unworthy people. And we glorify you who sit on the throne, and you, Lord Jesus, our Lamb, sacrificial Lamb, with all power and all wisdom and all knowledge and might, you alone are worthy to hold in your hand the will of God and to make it so. Not just overall history, but in our own lives. Forgive us for being so short-sighted, so weak-minded. Fill our hearts and our minds. Enlarge our spirits that we might get a glimpse of ultimate reality. And we'd live our lives for your glory. They are but a breath. We're only here a short time. And then we'll see fully, we'll know completely but between this day and that day, Lord, give us your grace, your power, your spirit to live our lives to glorify you. We pray it in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Amen.